This video is brought to you by Captivating History. The story of Davy Crockett sits at the intersection of American mythology and historical fact. A very real man, Crockett even served in the United States House of Representatives. However, his achievements on the expanding western frontier truly set his reputation apart. Myths do not emerge on their own. Crockett was well aware of the usefulness of his reputation as a quaint yet brave frontiersman. When he ran for national office, his campaign speeches were filled with homespun wisdom and rural metaphors. The image he cultivated was so evocative that legends rose around him while he was still alive. Davy came from a poor French Huguenot family. Davy's grandparents had immigrated to Ireland and changed the family name from de Crocotanye to Crockett. It's a good thing they did. It is hard to imagine Davy successfully fostering his rural hunter image with such an aristocratic sounding French name. His father, John Crockett, was born in Virginia. He fought in the Revolutionary War and was involved in the Battle of Kings Mountain. Davy was born in 1786 in Greene County, North Carolina. Today, it is part of Tennessee. But at the time, the area was within the jurisdiction of North Carolina. John ran a grist mill, but it was destroyed in a flood, along with the family home. In 1795, he was forced to declare bankruptcy. The poverty his family experienced was so severe that John indentured his son to a man named Jacob Siler. Growing in the backwoods, little Davy had almost no formal education. It didn't help that he was a wild child and was often truant when enrolled in school. So instead, he received 100 days worth of tutoring from an educated neighbor. John tried to force the boy into school, but Davy was headstrong and went off to make his way in the world. As a young man, Crockett worked as an extra farmhand or engaged in driving cattle. Finally, however, he returned to the family home and helped his father pay off the family debts. There was nothing conventional about Davy Crockett. His love life illustrates this fact. One of his many jobs was on the property of John Kennedy. There, he fell in love with Kennedy's niece, Amy Summer. There was just one problem. She was engaged to marry Kennedy's son. The undeterred Crockett convinced one of the wedding guests to marry him, but she married someone else instead. Davy ended up marrying another woman, Polly Finley, against the wishes of her family. They had three children, one of whom followed his father to represent Tennessee in the House of Representatives. Unfortunately, Polly died in 1815. He then married Elizabeth Patton, a local widow, and had three more children with her. Like many notable figures of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, Crockett entered public life through military service. In 1813, Creek warriors stormed Fort Mims in a modern-day Alabama and slaughtered almost all of its inhabitants. The incident was used to rally support for the Creek War, a complex conflict that pitted factions of the Creek tribe against each other. American troops supported the Lower Creeks, who were under the command of Andrew Jackson. Meanwhile, the Red Stick Creeks were aided by the British and Spanish. Crockett joined the Tennessee militia and participated in the fighting. However, he later remarked that he felt more comfortable hunting game in Alabama than fighting Native Americans. Nonetheless, he remained an enlisted man and continued to serve under Jackson's command. But eventually, Crockett tired of military life and paid a poor laborer to take his place in active duty until his official release in 1815. While Crockett's military career was somewhat flawed, it inspired him to engage in further public service. He was soon appointed commissioner and helped establish the boundaries of the newly established Lawrence County, Tennessee. This was just the start of his rapid rise in local politics. In 1817, Crockett was appointed Justice of the Peace. The following year, he won the role of Lieutenant Colonel of the 57th Regiment of Tennessee Militia. After a few years of focusing on successful business ventures, Davy returned to public office in 1821. He represented Lawrence and Hickman counties in the Tennessee General Assembly. In general, his preferences were informed by John Crockett's difficulties in providing for his family on the Tennessee frontier. Crockett adopted populist policies and opposed high tax burdens for the poor. Needless to say, these policies won him the fierce loyalty of many smaller landowners and agricultural workers in Lawrence and Hickman counties and throughout the state. However, 
Davy's political tendencies also won him some powerful enemies. They would eventually prove to be his political undoing. Remarkably, Crockett rose from the backwoods to a prominent role on the national stage. Nonetheless, his political career was anything but a straightforward success. He ran for a seat in the House of Representatives several times. Davy lost his first election in 1825. However, he won twice in a row in 1827 and two years later. In 1831, the determined campaigner lost to William Fitzgerald. However, Crockett made a comeback and narrowly defeated Fitzgerald in 1833, before finally being ousted in the 1835 elections after a painful defeat to Adam Huntsman. While Davy proved an able public servant, he also spent a good deal of effort on self-promotion. He wrote books and gave speeches promoting his image as a wild yet lovable frontiersman. In 1834, Crockett published an autobiography titled A Narrative of the Life of David Crockett, written by himself. However, the title was misleading. The book was completed with the assistance of political ally Thomas Chilton, U.S. Representative for Kentucky. The book focused on Crockett's life on the frontier. It played down his political career as well as his many successful business ventures. Though quite popular in Tennessee, Crockett's political ambitions were ultimately thwarted by Andrew Jackson and his supporters. Indeed, Jackson was a strong presence in Tennessee politics. After cementing his military reputation, the future president was also one of the founders of Memphis. The rift with the Jacksonians commenced in 1821, when the Tennessee politician supported Whig William Carroll for governor over Edward Ward. In the short term, the gamble paid off. Carroll won the election and rewarded Crockett for his support. However, Jackson did not forget the snub from his former subordinate. The rift deepened further in 1823 when he ran against Jackson's nephew-in-law, William Edward Butler, for the Tennessee General Assembly and won. But Crockett had no idea how powerful an enemy he had made or how deeply Jackson held a grudge. In 1824, Jackson first ran for president. Although he won a plurality of the popular vote and the Electoral College, the Whig John Quincy Adams won the presidency. However, if Crockett thought he had dodged a bullet, he was sorely mistaken. Jackson easily defeated Adams in 1828. The upstart representative insisted on the rights of settlers squatting on government-claimed land in western Tennessee. However, due to his opposition to Jackson, the Tennessee politician was generally supported by the Whig Party. Crockett also opposed the president and the military by taking a bold stand to close the West Point Academy. He believed that it provided an unfair avenue to power for the scions of rich and powerful families. Perhaps the most commendable step Davy took in his political career was his opposition to the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which was sponsored by President Jackson. Davy was the only member of the Tennessee delegation to oppose the measure. Although the Cherokees were deeply grateful for the lawmaker's support, many Tennessee constituents were appalled by this vote. It contributed heavily to his defeat in 1831. After losing, the disappointed former congressman was unsure of his next move. The claims of Texas applying for statehood captured Crockett's imagination. He told his friends that if the Jacksonian Martin Van Buren won the 1836 elections, he would head to Texas and lead a revolution in the territory. When the little magician captured the White House, Davy lived up to his promise. As he told a reporter, I told the people of my district that I would serve them as faithfully as I had done, but if not, they might go to hell and I would go to Texas. Crockett was a popular and charismatic figure and used his appeal to gather volunteers for the Texan cause. Finally, he went with some supporters to give a speech at the Madison County Courthouse. Hundreds of curious onlookers heard his words in favor of Texan independence. In early 1836, Crockett arrived in Texas and pledged allegiance to the provisional Texas government. He signed an oath with the other volunteers that read, I have taken the oath of government and have enrolled my name as a volunteer and will set out for the Rio Grande in a few days with the volunteers from the United States. On February 8th, he arrived at the Alamo Mission in San Antonio. The Alamo at that time was an essential feature in the military plans of the budding Texas Republic. 
What had started as a Spanish mission had become a fortified barracks as locals battled to maintain their security against roving bands of Apache. In 1821, the complex was transferred from Spain to Mexico. However, in 1835, Texas rebels seized the fortress from the Mexican forces and turned it into a stronghold. Two weeks after Davies' arrival at the Alamo, a Mexican army led by Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana arrived on the scene. The surprised garrison found itself under siege by the large and powerful force. Santa Ana's forces found themselves under fierce fire from the defenders. However, they drew even closer under the cover of an artillery barrage. Crockett and his men proved to be a formidable enemy. He led his soldiers into the four positions which the Mexican soldiers had established in nearby huts. Through close fighting and the support of grape shot from within the Alamo, they drove the enemy from the forward positions. Davy was involved in another temporarily successful counterattack. Despite the best efforts of the defenders, they were doomed. With their pleas for reinforcements mostly ignored, it was only a matter of time. After a 13-day fight and after Santa Ana ordered the advance, the Battle of the Alamo lasted a mere 90 minutes. Crockett was killed in the battle. Some claim that he was killed in a heroic last stand, while another version holds that he surrendered to the Mexican troops and was executed. Either way, Davy died that day, and his corpse was burned alongside the other defenders of the position. The exact burial spot for his ashes remains unknown. As the main celebrity casualty of the siege, Crockett became an icon of the successful struggle for Texan independence. The figure of Davy in his trademark coonskin cap a fashion choice often adopted by frontier hunters such as Crockett, was emulated by impressionable American children for more than a century. The legend of Crockett as the ultimate rugged frontier settler has a powerful hold on the national psyche. Davy grew up on the frontier and hunted, so there was a grain of truth to that image. However, he was also a clever man who carefully cultivated that image to reap the rewards in politics and business. Thus, it is more than fitting that Crockett died struggling to expand the vast American frontier while helping to create the Lone Star State. Nonetheless, the dramatic manner of the congressman's death powerfully solidified his posthumous reputation. To learn more about Davy Crockett, check out our book, Davy Crockett, a captivating guide to the American folk hero who fought in the War of 1812 and the Texas Revolution. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.